Today, everyone, we're going to talk about power, what it is and how to use it. And that might be a word that causes you pause, but I think when we're done today, you'll have a different thought about it. If you'd like to make progress in your career and get promoted, you're in exactly the right place. So get ready for some unconventional thinking and some new strategies. And man, I do welcome you to the next episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. If you're listening to this podcast or watching it, you could be here live for future episodes um, on your favorite social channel. You can uh, get access to those future episodes, know when we're going to do them and interact with us. See them sooner. If you'll join our Facebook or LinkedIn groups, you'll have a clue when they're going to happen. You can just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to join us. Today's episode is brought to you by Remarkable Masterclasses. Each masterclass is designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human you were born to be. Details on how to get on board for a specific skill can be found at remarkablemasterclass.com. It's as simple as that. With that, I'm going to bring in my guest. There he is. If you're with us uh, on video, you see that he is here. Let me introduce Michael to you. And then we'll dive in. Michael Wenderoth is an executive coach. He's helped thousands of aspiring leaders ethically leverage power and politics to break through and ascend. His contrarian views have appeared in the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and he's the author of a new book, Get Promoted, What You're Really Missing at Work That's Holding You Back. Prior to becoming an executive coach, Michael served 20 years in senior roles, bringing innovations to life in China, the U.S., and Europe. He holds an MBA from the Stan from Stanford Business School and is trained as an executive coach at Columbia University. His focus, as I said before, is on building power, a word that has negative connotations for some. He believes that understanding power is the key to success. If you want to move up, get big things done, or become a better leader. Uh, he is from Philadelphia, but coming to us today where he lives now outside of Madrid, Spain. And he's our guest, and I'm glad you're here. Michael, thanks for being Kevin. here. Immense pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to our conversation. It is my pleasure. Let's see. We've got uh, John Paul Galette says um, says nice things. We're happy to see those. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I'm going to ask you a question, and I know that you told me that you did your homework, uh, meaning that you listened to or watched a couple of other podcast episodes, so you may have noticed that there's really two questions I ask, one at the start and one at the end that I pretty much always ask, and that one at the start is a little bit about your journey. I think when we meet new people, in this case, uh, at a distance, that to, to know a little bit about sort of how they got where they are is useful. So without giving us the full story, tell us a little bit about your journey, Michael. Yeah, so I've had a very diverse journey. As you can tell, right, I am from the States, but um, I just crossed the, the Rubicon, so to speak, and have spent more than half of my life working outside, both in Asia, outside the States, in Asia and over here in Europe. Um, so I bring that kind of perspective. I still serve clients worldwide. And I think the interesting question is how does this introverted, quiet college history major um, go from small town Minnesota where I studied to China for multiple years, Silicon Valley, Europe, and then wind up being a coaching executive globally? So again, without kind of doing that, you could kind of spin the globe if we were to go around in my career. But um, I had it in kind of the seminal piece starting, right? As a history major, you need to find a job. <laughs> and this was in the early 90s. Make mom and dad happy and find a job. Exactly, exactly. And also, I was just inherently interested in where things were emerging. And that's always been a theme for me. And so I went over to China. Um, this was in the early 90s as it was opening up. I was originally in journalism, which kind of still runs through everything I do of kind of trying to figure out how things work and explain those to other people. And I ended up being over there and moving into business. And I was setting up the first private hospital in China for many years, moved over where the next thing was emerging in Silicon Valley in the, in the mid late nineties. I was very interested in what was happening. And that's when I was at Stanford and kind of reinvented myself and, and moved into marketing. Um, that took me to Europe. And all through this, I've, you know, probably not the best advice will kind of go through this. I, I shifted industries, uh, roles, um, countries. And the upside of that was 
multiple times, I look this back about five times throughout my career, I've kind of reinvented myself. Um, the more you do it, uh, you know, this ability to adapt, um, the more you get used to it. And that also got me thinking a lot about how does one reinvent or adapt and succeed in new situations so you're not starting over. And about five years ago, I left corporate and I moved into executive coaching, which really fits with a lot of the stuff I do of helping people, explaining how human behavior works to help make better leaders. So let's just start there. So um, if you're coaching someone uh, who is thinking about making a major shift like you've done multiple times, what's your advice to them? So maybe someone who's listening, who's either thinking about doing something like you've done or doing that again, uh, or, or maybe has already been in two or three of those uh, phases or, or, or chapters and is now looking to, to move really forward from where they are. What's your advice around all that? Well, the one is for them to almost do kind of an inventory of things that they are interested or where they want to move to. But more importantly, a lot of people think very kind of binary, like, you know, they're leaving their company or they're staying or they're doing this or they're that. And as soon as you see binary thinking, it's expand some of the options, number one. And then the second is, especially when you are making transitions and shifting to new areas, is think in terms of experiments. You know, the, the saying the grass is always greener on the other side. I see a lot of people kind of shift over or I'm so sick of my corporate role, then move over and realize, hmm, it's not all that it was cracked up to be. I could have done some experiments to see was that the right path or to get more kind of under my belt so that I was positioned well when I moved to the new area. Those would be the two big things. So the subtitle, so, so thanks for that. I appreciate that. It kind of maybe leads us a little bit to where, to the book where the subtitle of the book says what you're really missing at work and what's holding you, that's holding you back. And, and we're going to dive into a lot of the big ideas and, and some, some, I think really helpful stuff in the book. But if someone's here and they're saying, man, why have I gotten passed over three times? Um, what, what might that thing be? So the number one thing that most people are overlooking is this, they're holding this strong belief that, you know, what they do and their hard work and their smarts will just shine and it will speak for itself. And we know as you move up in organizations, right, you are, you know, you are working through other people, you are in an interdependent environment. And so really, and what the research would, would show, what really helps you, you know, ascend, get things done, at the highest levels is the ability to influence your interpersonal skills, working through with or managing up um, others. And, and that's a critical skill that a lot of people will dismiss, particularly if they see certain people who they call political, um, who have kind of this behavior where, oh, they're not doing anything or they're not that smart, but they're, why are they getting promoted and I'm not? So that's usually this, this kind of belief in terms of what propels you. All right. So there's three words and you mentioned one of them just now political. I think there are three words that you sort of take in the book and sit them on their head. And political is one of them. You've started to go there. So let's just talk about that. You, you, I think that, and I think you say this in the book that there are mindset shifts that Correct. you would encourage us to think differently about these three words. So I'm going to say these three words one at a time and help us think about maybe where people go normally and where they might go instead that might be more helpful. And that let's start with that first one. Yeah. People are political or they're playing politics. And I would encourage, and this is an activity I actually do with, with people as anyone who's out there, either write on a piece of paper, or put it in the chat board. What are the first words that come to mind? And I can pretty much guarantee you, that they are all negative words, backstabbing, you know, a brown nosing, all these words that are the negative version of politics that, that come out. So, and, and these are kind of reinforced through things in the popular press um, that we hear negative associations with the word. 
Well, and in fact, what, what, what I mean, if you just in the U.S. with two parties, which is easier than in some other countries, like if you're on one side, they always accuse the other side of playing politics, which just makes it goes into your point. Right. That that's somehow a dirty word. How should we be thinking about that instead? What's a more helpful way for us to think about that? acknowledging that that reality, but thinking about it differently? Yeah. So if you kind of rethink this and you simply think about it as kind of your interpersonal influence, right? Politics is simply the mechanism by which decisions are made. And so some of those are formal mechanisms, right? Votes. But a lot of that is informal, right? You know, two people are talking and one person's senior or louder or has more gravitas. So the, we know all these biases. And so it behooves you to really understand how these decisions are being made in groups and you know you either want to be aware of that or you may actually leverage some of those things those interpersonal influence skills your ability to form relationships with people who have influence you're going to have to work with with those people in organizations to get stuff done okay second word uh authenticity and, and I'll, I'll say, Michael, that we've had guests here talking about authenticity, which I think that you would enjoy and probably would have great conversations about and with. Uh, and yet that word is almost becoming meaningless because it's used so much. What, what, what do we need to be thinking about differently related to authenticity? Yeah, authenticity is such a loaded word. And so this really depends on kind of the definition people are using. So I think people have different definitions out there. And so it behooves you to kind of First, think about what your definition is or how other people are defining it, because it can mean like if we just really quickly think about it. It was authenticity mean to say everything like that's on your mind, which I think some people are using it in that way. There was a it's Jim Carrey movie that didn't go so well for him. <laughs> right. Imagine if we were like the cartoons and the bubble was above our head and everything we were thinking. You know, there was just a piece in The Economist, right, about showing up as your whole self may not be the best advice all the time. So there's that piece of what some people say is authentic. Then there is this piece around authentic of are you being true to your values, okay? Which is, I think, quite important as you think about what your North Star and your ethical lines are. And, you know, the other version is kind of authentic to yourself. Well, you know, we're constantly in different contexts, in different situations, different periods of our life. You know, what is our true self? It's constantly moving. So I think you have those three levels of definition. And, you know, we could go into more depth around unpacking, you know, which of those I find useful or not. But I would say the problem with the overuse of authenticity and where it gets people in trouble is when they have this very rigid definition of who they are. You know, I am this, I only show up this way, I will say these types of things. And as we know, we're constantly growing or evolving you know, in our careers as people. And so sometimes people will hold on to authenticity too tightly and say, I won't do this, I won't do that, and makes them rigid and causes them not to want to learn new behaviors, strategies, or skills. And that's where growth comes from, right? Because it's either uncomfortable or they're saying it's not them. Or, or we've labeled ourselves, well, that's not me. Well, maybe it wasn't once. Maybe that's not what it needs to be moving forward. Just because I'm willing to flex doesn't necessarily mean I'm not being authentic, right? Right. Uh, because who I am is changing. So the third one of those three things uh, is where we started at the beginning uh, before I even introduced you. And that's with that five letter word loaded with loaded, loaded with, with thoughts, which is power. So yeah. let's talk about power. That's, that's really, Michael, where I want us to spend the rest of our time together as we talk about your new book, Get Promoted. Uh, you can see it here if you're watching. Get Promoted what you're really missing at work that's holding you back. Let's talk about power. Because to me, as I told you before we started, this is a book about power, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, lots of negative baggage around that word, right? So yeah. talk about how we should shift our thinking around power. So again, when you ask people or you, at, you get them to name you know, powerful people, immense load of negative words come out dictators you know abusive toxic and again these are been fueled by the popular press and have been fueled by a lot of powerful people who use power 
to oppress, to run organizations or countries into the ground. So that definitely exists out there. But if you pull back in this idea that we were talking about of reframing, if you really look at the definition of power, you know, go to the dictionary, it is very neutral. It is nothing more than a force by which you get things done. And it's invisible, it's omnipresent. Anytime you're with two people, there's always a power dynamic that's going on. It's kind of invisible. And so the fact that most people shy away or reject it is problematic because this is actually a very powerful mechanism, which if you understand how to harness it, okay, or build it, you know, one, you can see things going on around you, so-called, you know, power plays that might be going on in an organization that might be detrimental to your career or your initiatives. But the second thing is understanding it is then to say, hmm, if I can break this down and, and be less non-judgmental about it, I can think about how to use these forces for, and I'm just going to, you know, say good in this sense. And, you know, it's like leverage. It helps accelerate your impact, can help accelerate you in terms of what you're, what you're doing. And, and I would just encourage people to think about if we switch this to an analogy. Think about power like fire. So fire, you just take that, you could burn everything down right? Very destructive force mechanism. But power also, power the whole city, power the whole, light up the whole nation, warm all the houses, feed people. Move most all the vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. And so people don't want to talk about it. And then here's where we see those who really want to harness it. A lot of them are using it for their own purposes, which may be at odds with what's good for the greater number for their own personal benefit. And those who have rejected it then put themselves at an inherent disadvantage when they could be using it as well to do lots of great things, be that for their careers or their teams or their initiatives. Yeah, so, so if we take that analogy of fire, right? Power is like fire. Well, we, we don't have to have a lot of experience to know that, well, for fire, we need fuel and oxygen like there that's the sources of the fire if you will right and you talk in the book about the sources of power you talk about five of them and i don't know we won't have time to go deeply into all of them um one of them is political skills we've sort of talked about about what you mean by that so we'll, we'll sort of move past that one but let's talk about some of the others and and it's interesting to me that especially for this next one it's another word that people sometimes they don't have quite as negative a feeling about as they do with power but they'll roll their eyes when i say right. network so when you say that your network is a source of your power and i want all of you to be thinking as michael's answering here about how does this fit into your world and your career and your promotional path so when you what do you mean when you're talking about network and what advice would you give us around that yeah, so I have, you know, this other immense source of power is your network and your social capital. And, you know, I would encourage everyone out there, you can do their, you know, to build on your, your comment there, Kevin, very quick exercise is think about, you know, how'd you spend your time? How are you spending your time? The last, you know, 40, 60 hours at, at work last week. Who, with who have you been spending your time and, and how? And this idea of networking, and a lot of my book, is based on good research that has been around for a long time that shows what brings us new ideas, what propels our careers, et cetera. And so there's a couple dimensions of networking that I get encouraged people to think about, which is one is a very simple idea of if you're trying to bring in new ideas, if you're always spending time with the same people by default, you all have basically have the same information. But those who are connected to, you know, if you think it's in a, inside of an organization, cross departments, because information gets siloed, or connected to interesting ideas outside, you're the linkage, right, that's bringing in new information, which is valuable, can be valuable to the group, can be valuable to those, you know, who are in power. And you're the one who is the conduit of that. So that is, in a way, a source of power, because you are bringing that information. And we show, like, this helps 
you know, most jobs are found through these so-called weak ties. Um, innovations, this is basically what consultants do. They're bringing in information from other, other areas. And so the idea of bringing in information and having these ties outside is one dimension. The second is when you lay out kind of your organization, you want to know, you know who has power and influence, control of resources. A lot of people spend kind of time down in the organization instead of thinking about how do they manage and get alignment or build relationships with those who have power and influence. Right. And, and that can also extend into this other key idea, which is, has a lot of currency right now around sponsorship. I mean, we know that those who are anointed early, right? High potential, um, have sponsors, have one-on-ones with those at the top. They are introduced to new initiatives. They're talked about during succession planning. They are given disproportionate resources. <laughs> I bet you in your company, most people don't even know, like there's special programs for those who have been anointed. And so this idea of who you're in relationship with, who you know, is really important to thinking about your career or helping you get your initiatives done. So there are some people who are watching or listening now or later, Michael, and they're saying, okay, yeah, but now I'm, I work remotely or I work remotely most of the time, or I'm in a hybrid environment and I'm not in the office the same days as, as, as those people that I'd like to network with. What's your sort of very tactical advice for that fact? I mean, that's a fact, but mm-hmm. what's your advice around that? Um, if you were to, to, to give that right away. Yeah. So to flip that around and say, where's the opportunity, right? When we see kind of a challenge is to say, how might I use this in some way? Everyone's kind of in the same boat. And, and so here it behooves you to be proactive and to say, you know, hmm, you know, I should be reaching out to, to certain people or maybe take initiative and set something up or, right, you know, can't go on a book tour <laughs> this last year. Wow. I could like be on hundreds of podcasts, right? Of of being out there in in relationships with people. So it, part of it is kind of how you frame and see things. You can look and say, hey, there's no opportunity here, but you could totally flip it around. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that, and, and I agree with that 100%, and that is we, we shouldn't be, and I, I'm guessing you, would, you could add to this, we shouldn't just be thinking about the network that we're doing. If, if, say if we're in a larger corporate organization, which is sort of the way I framed what I just asked. Yeah. There's a lot of people we should could be should be thinking about networking with that go far beyond the people that we saw in the office before anyway. Fair? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there are three other sources of power that you mentioned. And one of them is control of resources, which is kind of more obvious ish, like that mm-hmm. really you do have resources or maybe some positional stuff that comes with that one. Um, and, and there's one on executive presence and communication, that one probably doesn't surprise people as much. The last one I want to talk about is one that people might think, again, a little differently about, uh, and that's the idea of your visibility or brand. And I think you bumped up against this idea a couple of times already. Most people yeah. think of brand and they think of Coca-Cola, M&Ms, whatever. Um, and I, I, I it, that makes me sound like I'm hungry. I only use food examples. Uh, I could say Canon or Dell. Those are two things I can see in front of me right now. Um, right. But we think about brand. We think about, you know, consumer product stuff. Mm-hmm. You're using that word for us. What's our brand? How visible are we? You want to say a little bit more about that? Maybe give us a couple of tactical ideas there. Yeah. So brand is is essentially, you know, if we use the, the definition that I, I use in the book and I favor is kind of, you know, What are other people saying about you when you're not in the room? And so like it or not, you know, this example of products, you know, we have a brand in our companies. You know, what do we represent? What do we stand for? How do people know of us? And, you know, it's a simple saying too, right? You cannot promote what you cannot recall, what you cannot find. And this is really important in organizations is, you know, that, that you have some visibility and people associ- associate you with something. Um, because again, those conversations, there's a lot of kind of bias and so forth that happens in organizations when, when there are conversations around succession planning about who to put on projects. You want to be part of that conversation, even if you're not in the room. So your network, what we talked about before, sponsors thinking about that, but also ways that you can 
ensure that you have visibility because there's also biases right in a group. Well-known research shows that we associate one person as the leader and also got news for you, right? Not everyone's got purity of intent in organizations. So someone is likely, you know, this negative side of politics that we talked about, maybe taking credit for your work. And so it behooves you to manage some of the narrative, to be part of that conversation and not just to keep your head down all the time and assume that things, you know, people are talking about you. They're probably not because people are incredibly busy. And so to your point of kind of very tactical things you can do is one, to be aware of it, right? You cannot promote what you, what you cannot recall. And, you know, this isn't about, I think there is some level of, of, of owning what you do and, and taking credit or making sure, right, you're getting credit for things. But it's not about kind of over self-promotion. The best kind of promotion is other people talking about you, right? So building relationships with those people, mentioning to sponsors, right, what you're interested, where you want to go in the company. But some of the more creative things, and I talk about a lot of these examples in the book to go back to this part around networking, right? It's not about just always showing up in mixers, but to take strategic positions, roles. So project managers are great examples, right? If they are running a cross-functional project, information and so forth flows through them, which gives them an advantage, which then can also be used to, to build relationships, to provide information first to important people, which creates visibility. So these are things that you, a lot of people will say, this is not part of my job. In fact, it's like, it's not doing my job if I'm doing those things. But I would argue the opposite, that it is a very important part of what you do, particularly if, let's say you're managing a team. And I see this all the time, right? We care a lot, see all these self-effacing leaders who wanna see their team grow. Well, if you're not part of the conversation, know which way the strategic winds are blowing, know where the opportunities are coming from, you're not helping your team. Yeah, it's, and, and, it's not, and I love the how you said that because it's not just about, well, I'm, I'm not doing my job because I'm trying to take care of me. No, when we're doing that, we're actually helping our entire team. And, and if you're a leader saying, well, I don't have time for that, you're probably spending too much time, as Michael said earlier, looking down in the weeds of the work where you need to trust your team, delegate more so you can do this higher value work that not only serves your team and the larger organization, but also happens to serve you. Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, and this point, Kevin, is, is, is really important, I think, for because a lot of the these kind of humble, hardworking, smart leaders who who hit the ceiling. They want to help other people. And yes, you can help other people by helping yourself. And that is actually a mechanism by which kind of do this reorientation that that can propel you and and. and make you realize you need to spend time networking. You need to be part of the conversation. You need to be build your brand or the, your team's brand. There are two other little, like, these are like little things in the book that I really liked. Uh, and I'm just going to just, I'm going to say this and just on each one, just give me about one minute on these ideas. Okay. First one is the power of asking. Tell me what, so many people worry about, well, if I ask and I look stupid, or something along those lines. Why do you think asking is so powerful? Again, I go back to, if we look at really good social science evidence that no one is, you know, unfortunately reading, it's we systematically underestimate people's willingness when we ask to say yes. I mean, by more than 50%. So one is to know if you're doing it, people are more likely to say yes. And people will work themselves up of like, oh, I don't know if it's my place. I don't think this is the, the right time to do it. And they, they work themselves up thinking about what, you know, might happen when, you know, advocate for yourself or be direct or get clarity. And what's the worst that can happen? That's one of the things to think about, right? Well, the, we could get a no or you're not getting promoted right now and here's why. But then you have information, which then becomes very useful instead of spinning your wheels for a month thinking about what the other person might say. Last thing before we shift gears and go into the sort of the round, round the, the, the final turn here, um, you use an analogy of pruning the tomatoes. 
So everybody, here's your gardening lesson today. But no, you're really going to talk about something a little different than that. But tell us about pruning the tomatoes. Yeah, so this is, um, you know, you've written multiple books. So this is, you know, as you're writing, you, you find this analogy and it happened to be, you know, gardening season. And, and I was out there and, and it's this idea, which in, in the literature, right, is called strategic quitting, which is to say, if you think about a plant and we can use tomatoes as the example here, that as it's growing, if it's sending all its shoots out, you know, its energy is dissipated because it's going in multiple directions. And when our energy is dissipated, right, we end up not being able to do anything really well. And particularly now with all the distractions going on. So your ability to focus or oftentimes is not necessarily what you're doing. It's a lot about what you're not doing. So thinking about where you need to spend less time or prune off opportunities, delegate that to people and where you're really going to move the needle and where you want to put your, your efforts. And a lot of these pieces around power, these sources of power, if you're spending more time, you know, you're increasing your influence and the levers by which, if you so choose, right, you can exercise to, to, to get things done. All right. I, I'm going to shift gears and ask a couple of final questions. I, I appreciate everything we've talked about, Michael. The, uh, the book, again, is called Get Promoted. What you're really missing at work that's holding you back here is what my copy looks like. And uh, so uh, what do you do, Michael, for fun? You're not, you're not doing this every day. You're not coaching people 24 seven. Like what do you do for fun? So, so two things I, I, I do for fun. Um, and I, I do work a lot. I'm very engaged and I love my clients, but um, I'm a competitive tennis player. I was in college and I continue that. Um, I'm blessed being here in Spain, right? This is the golden age <laughs> of of Spanish tennis. Um, so I, you know, keep my, it's my form of meditation, getting out there and playing um, tennis. But the other thing may surprise you, which is like every year I pick a different activity that I want to kind of learn or master. And so we've been, we finished the renovation of our house. And so I'm in the phase of doing a lot of landscaping which I find absolutely fascinating because you're coordinating all these different things. It's like a putting a, a movie in motion um, of flowers and colors and thinking about cost and budget. So that's, that's been fun. Just also being outside in this whole crazy pandemic. Which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, and maybe you do it outside or maybe you do it inside, but like me, I know you're a reader. So tell us what you're reading right now, Michael. Yeah, so I'm always reading <laughs> three books, uh, which is sometimes a little bit of excessive, but they're in different areas. Um, I don't read that many business books, but the one that I'm, I'm reading now, I love a lot. Actually, two of them are sitting here. So, you know, um, Chip Heats and Carla Starr's Making Numbers Count, um, I find fascinating um, because numbers, people can get lost to them. And so if you think about how to become a better communicator, how to make numbers real, and really touch to people. That's a fantastic, um, quick read. And the second one, I've um, sometimes read very academic stuff. So this one will probably only appeal to a small fraction of your audience. But um, this is a gem. Um, it's a uh, historical and conceptual foundations of measurement in the human sciences, um, credos and controversies. Um, by Derek, Dr. Derek Briggs at University of Colorado. He's in their um, research and assessment um, group. And, and so it's quite academic, fairly mathematical, but a lot of us don't really think about measurement. And there's this whole discussion right now about, you know, how do we measure educational assessment across school systems? And then also psychotic, you know, psychological assessments in terms of even as coaching, we use these assessments. And he digs into the history of that and really lays it out, getting you to think about that if you're a thoughtful person who cares about, hey, is there integrity behind numbers? Right. Um, so that's my other one. And then I was reading kind of a fun one. And this was for those people who have kids, particularly as the summer, um, I think it's upstairs, but it's called Sticky Night Skies. Um, and it helps you remember constellations you know, within an hour, all these constellations. And so I think that's really interesting because as coaches, we're getting people to kind of connect things very easily. And so I love that. I'm using it with my kids and 
it's summer, get out, get this book because it's like fantastic. You will remember our constellations like you never have before. <laughs> That's what I'm reading. That. See, folks, you never know what you're going to get here on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Everything from how to prune your tomatoes to how to recognize constellations and remember them. Uh, so, Michael, what you most what you most want us to remember is how to get a hold of you, how to connect with you, where to get the book. Like, where do you want to point people? Uh, what? How do we learn more about what you're up to? Yeah, so my website, um, which is changwenderoff.com is the the best resource there's a download of the first chapters of my book which is also available on amazon or wherever you get your books and there's also resources in there um, to help people think through and adapt some of these what are feel like uncomfortable associations um, but to help them really accelerate in their leadership journey that's chang wenderoff c-h-a-n-g w-e-n-d e-r O-T-H dot com. So now, Michael, we're not quite done. I've got a couple more things to say to you, but now I want to talk to everybody else and ask all of you a question for you to ponder uh, and to think about and actually to take action on. And that is now what? What are you going to do with what you just heard? Are you going to stop and think differently about power and politics, maybe authenticity? Are you going to think about these sources of power? Are you going to perhaps say, I need to spend some time on my network or I need to work on my personal brand as it relates to how it can serve my team and my organization. I don't know what that might be for you, but if you don't take some action from today, this will be of limited value, really, at the end of, at, at the, end of the day. So I hope that you will take seriously that question to take some action as a result of, of having been here. And so, Michael, thank you so much for having been here. It was such a pleasure to have you. Kevin, also a great pleasure. Thank you. All right. Make sure everybody, you go to changwenderoth.com and make sure if you like this episode that you hit a like button wherever you might be or encourage someone else to subscribe to this uh, podcast. We'd love to have you because every week we're back with another episode and including next week, we'll be back with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks everybody.